sinner paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. coming, all will be there, each one receiving justly is due, hide in the saving, say cleansing blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. But the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of But the blood of Jesus, this is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take your Bible this morning and go to Exodus chapter 8. Brother Dean, I'm going to add a few verses to what I told you earlier. Okay, I know. That, that hurts to you put some up on live stream, but I'm going to, we're going to read verses 5 through 15 of Exodus chapter 8. Verses 5 through 15 of Exodus chapter 8. We'll read them responsibly as we begin together on verse 5. We'll end together on verse 15, and we'll alternate reading as we normally do. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. <clears throat> All of us standing pleased to read God's Word. And let's begin on verse 5 of Exodus chapter 8. Ready? And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments, and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, and said, Entreat the Lord, that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee, and for thy servants, and for thy people, to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy houses, and from thy servants, and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, 
and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today and for the people of God singing praises to God. Lord, it's just been delightful to be here this morning. I'm praying that you'll bless the special now and that it will continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word today and that you'll help each of us to give our careful attention to the only book you've ever written. Speak to us today and use the special in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to open up your word together this morning. Lord, I need your help today as I bring this truth to this morning. I pray you would help me to say what I ought to say and leave unsaid what doesn't need to be said. And Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would speak to each and every heart that's here this morning. I pray that you would take the truth home to each individual here today. And you would help us to listen carefully. And I would ask you would help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, this is a vital, vital truth that we look at today. And I pray, Lord, that you'd use it in each one of our hearts and lives. And we'd never forget that word tomorrow. 
In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, you may not know this, but March 20th coming up is World Frog Day. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? The things you learn when you come to church. On that day, you're supposed to examine local ponds and rivers and lakes for uh, frogs and make sure that they're protected and nothing happens to them. That World Frog Day has been around for a few years from what I understand. But it wasn't, while it may be kind of new to you and it was new to me, it wasn't new to the Egyptians. They, they were very fond of frogs. In fact, they had a goddess, they, part of their religion. They had an Egyptian goddess who was depicted as having a frog's head, the head of a frog. I've known a few. No, I better not say that. But. <laughs> they had another god who was the god of the Nile, Happy, H-A-P-I, and he was depicted as holding a frog in his hand, and out of his mouth flowed a stream of nourishment. And they worshipped him as well. In fact, it was against the law in Egypt to kill a frog. So, World Frog Day wasn't a really a new concept to them. But what God put upon them was World Frog Week. And uh, one of the second plague that He sent was sending frogs upon them. And... When God sends the frogs, they, they've returned to Pharaoh, Aaron and Moses have, after the first plague, which was the water turning to blood. And that is ended, and it seems like, according to the Scripture, that uh, there was no time wasted in between. They appeared right before Pharaoh again and told him the frogs were coming. And... Frog worship, again, was very prominent in the land. And Pharaoh doesn't seem to be too upset about it, except there's a difference this time. You see, when the water was turned to blood, it, it appears as if there might have been water in Pharaoh's house. And he didn't care so much that everybody else was having trouble, just so he wasn't having trouble. A lot of times, rulers can be that way. He didn't care that his... Subjects couldn't bathe or cook or eat as long as there was fresh water in his place. I've been told that Queen Victoria, when she couldn't stand the sight of squalor and poverty just beyond her garden wall, she built a bigger wall to block her view so she wouldn't have to see it rather than do anything about it. And this time, Moses tells Pharaoh the frogs are not just going to come upon everybody else. They're coming on you too. They're going to be everywhere. They're going to come into your homes and into your private quarters. This time Pharaoh's not going to have any escape. He's not going to be able to go to his house and get away from the frogs. They're going to be everywhere. Now, it wasn't long before the people got very disgusted with all the frogs. The Egyptians, while they were a godless people as far as the God of heaven, they had many false gods, they were a pretty meticulous people, and they were a, a hygienic and a clean people. And for them to have their homes infested with frogs was pretty repulsive thought to them, as it would be to you or me. I... I I don't have anything particularly against frogs. As long as they're in the pond or the stream or in the field, I don't want to pull my bed covers back at night and have to scrape the frogs out of bed. But that's what they did in Egypt. Can you imagine, ladies, as you uh, open the oven to put something in the oven and there's frogs in your oven? Can you imagine you open the cupboard to get out a glass to get something to drink and you pull the glass down and out jumps a frog? Can you imagine? Fellas, you get home after working hard and you, you get the remote to the television and you sit in your favorite chair and you hear a squish. There's frogs in your chair. They're everywhere. 
I, I cannot imagine. And you know, there's an amazing thing here. That the verse 7 says, The magicians of Egypt came, and with their enchantments, they brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. I, I thought, how does that help anything? I mean, hey, Pharaoh, look what we can do. We can give you more frogs. Well, thanks a lot, fellas. That's what I'm looking for. How about taking some of these away? That's what I think they would have done. Wow. Just when you think, you know, you, you get them out of your oven and you cook a nice loaf of bread and you get it out and you take a knife and you slice it and when you slice it, right in the middle of the bread is a frog. I mean, they're everywhere. You, you just can't imagine. I guess they would have had to learn how to cook frogs maybe, huh? Walk, stepping on frogs, sitting on frogs, going to bed with frogs. Think about the, as you kill them, as you step on them, and they're dead, they're dead, and they begin to stink, and the stench. Can you imagine? God, but you understand, God was making them sick of their gods. Making them sick of their idols. Now we know from, you know if you read Exodus all and you read especially about the plagues, Pharaoh's a pretty stubborn guy. He hardens his heart very easily. Now the king was getting fed up with the frogs as well as everybody else. And it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Here's the superpower of the day, Egypt. And the leader of that superpower probably could have fielded the biggest army of, of, of that time. And God brings him to his knees. Not with soldiers. Not with bombs. But with frogs. And he's begging. He gets calls for Moses and Aaron. And he wants them to get rid of the frogs. And Moses asked him, if you look at your Bible, Moses said unto him in verse 9, I love this, glory over me. <laughs> Moses was saying, well, I'll be. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses that they remain in the river only? Hey, when do you want me to do this, Pharaoh? Now listen, if they've been everywhere, they're in your bed, they're in your house, they're in your chair, they're in your food, they're everywhere you walk, they're everywhere, and you say, when would you like to get rid of these? What would you say, church? <laughs> right now! Yesterday! But Pharaoh looks at them and says, tomorrow! Hugh Pyle was a famous preacher. He's in heaven now. He had a famous sermon he preached from this passage. It's called, One More Night with the Frogs. Why would you choose to have one more night with frogs? Why tomorrow? I, I can't believe he'd rather stay another night with the frogs. Tomorrow. Maybe, maybe he thought he'd buy himself some time. Maybe he thought the Egyptian, the, 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 his, his uh, magicians are working on something and maybe they're going to come up with some way to get rid of these things. And I won't have to bow to God. But how many men have said tomorrow? How many of us have told God tomorrow? One pastor tells a story how he was out visiting in his neighborhood and he came to a home and invited the couple to church and the wife came and got saved. But the husband wouldn't budge. Every time the pastor went to the house, the husband would say the same thing. I'll come as soon as I get straightened out. I'll come as soon as I get straightened out. This went on for several years. When he got word one day, the man had died. And he had the funeral service at the church. And the pastor looked down at the man in the casket and he said, I guess he finally got straightened out. But it's too late. It's too late. 
a lot of folly can be laid up in the word tomorrow. Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day can bring forth. I think about the parable of the rich man in Luke chapter 12 who had much success in life and he had barns that were filled. He said, I've got much treasure laid up for many years. I don't know what I'm going to do except to tear down these barns and build bigger ones. So I can have more room to bestow all my goods and I'm going to tell myself, eat, drink, and be merry. And God looked down at him and said, Thou fool, this night your soul will be required of thee. He was thinking about tomorrow. And God said, you don't have a tomorrow. You're going into eternity tonight. Only a hardened heart says tomorrow in relation to spiritual demands from God. It's a hard heart that puts God off, that stalls His deliverance and presumes upon tomorrow. The New Testament teaches us that now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Moses answered Pharaoh and he said, Okay, be it according to your word. Tomorrow the frogs will die. And so the people and Pharaoh spent one more night with the frogs. Now the next day all the frogs died. The Bible says they shoveled them into heaps. Can you imagine what that smelled like? In fact, the Bible tells us the land stank. It reeked. It would, it would probably be a while before those people would begin to worship a frog again. I think they had their fill of frogs. You would think that as the Bible says, respite would have come to Pharaoh and he would have uh, gave in to let them go, but he doesn't. He hardens his heart. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Did you catch that? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. By the way, that's the problem with the American justice system right now. Is sentence is not executed speedily. When the burden of the land got eased, Pharaoh thought he got away with it. Nothing ever caused him to loose his grip upon the children of Israel, the people of Israel, until massive death came. The death angel had to come and take the firstborn from every family. Then he said, get out of here. Go. What do you tell God tomorrow? When God comes to you and says, how long are you going to allow this in your life? How long are you going to put up with this? How long are you going to keep this, still, this stinky, filthy frog in your life? And you tell God, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll get serious about my relationship with God. Tomorrow, I'll forgive that person who's hurt me. Tomorrow, I'll get back into shape. Tomorrow, I'll get my finances in order. Tomorrow I'm going to start serving God. What is your tomorrow? What, what do you tell God? Hey God, tomorrow I'll fill in the blank. What do you what is it when God talks to you and tells you something and you tell God later? Later. What frogs are you allowing? to stay in your life that God wants you to get rid of. 
And yet when God deals with you, you put it off. You procrastinate. Oh, we don't always tell God, no, we don't say, no, God, I'm not going to do that. No, we just tell God, yeah, God, I'm going to do that. I'm just not ready yet. And just as, as, as awful and as slimy and as stinky and as repulsive as frogs being everywhere, and you can't look at people like that and think, how could they want to stay another night with that stuff in their life? How could they live another day with those slimy things around? In everything they touch, everything they do, God looks at you and me and says, how can you live another day like that? How can you tolerate that in your life? Tomorrow, God. I want you to go to the New Testament to Acts 24. Would you turn there with me, please? Acts 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts 24. Thank you for turning there with me. Acts 24. Acts 24, Paul has been arrested and he's appearing before the governor named Felix. In verse number 24 of Acts 24, the Bible says, After certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix what, church? Felix trembled. And he answered, Go thy way for this time, and when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. You know what, you know what Felix was saying? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Now he had hoped that money should have been given him of Paul that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. And after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. I want you to notice that Paul deals with Felix here about something. He, feel, he deals with him about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Paul is dealing with Felix about righteousness. A righteousness that Felix did not have. That he did not possess. God is righteous. Man is not. God is righteous. We are not. What appears to be righteous to man is not righteous with God. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 said, All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. That isn't all of the, all of the bad things we do. That's all of the good things we could do. I know sometimes we look at people who are not saved. Uh, some of the, you point to some of the wealthiest people of the world. And they don't know Christ as their Savior. And we say, yeah, but you know, they do a lot of good things. Or they give this money to charity. They give that money to charity. And, and by the way, in my eyes, I think that's still a good thing. But it isn't in God's eyes. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in His sight. You know what it means? When a sinner does anything to try to impress God, it doesn't impress God. He's not impressed by our righteousnesses. Cain came with the offering of his hands that he made. He, he tilled the ground and, and he said, Here God, here's what I brought to you. Something that I made with my own hands. And God says, I don't accept it. I don't accept it. Cain, all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags in my sight. He talked to Felix about a righteousness that he don't have. That's God talking about our good, not our bad. The world, listen, God is holy. God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. There was a time in the book of Acts where Paul said when God in times past winked at the ignorance of man. 
He said, but now He commands all men everywhere to what? Repent. God doesn't wink at your sin at all. God is holy. And we got away from preaching that and teaching that and we've bowed to, be, to, a, to a politically correct God, to a culturally acceptable God, and we've gotten away from presenting the God of the Bible to people, and therefore people refer to God as the, that man, the man upstairs. Me and the big guy, we got, a, we got an agreement. And we use slang terms for God. But I think if we lifted God up to His rightful place and we saw the Lord high and lifted up like we ought to, my friend, folks would tremble. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I'm thankful Paul didn't try to pull God down to Felix's level. He preached righteousness to him that Felix didn't have. Yesterday at the funeral for Brother Stacy Meadows. Stacy got saved from a biker background. I'm I'm trying to think. I <clears throat> I don't think it was it wasn't the Hell's Angels that he rode with. But I think it was a group called the Disciples of the Devil. How about that for a name? Hmm? Stacy, as much as he was an in-your-face and loudmouth biker, he became an in-your-face and loudmouth Christian. And he had no problems telling somebody, if you don't get born again, you'll bust hell wide open. And he said, you'll split the gates of hell in two. He just very blunt with that. You say, oh, you don't even be saved that way. It's funny, he did. And by the way, that's how some people are going to get saved. You don't, you don't get somebody saved by, by not telling them the truth. You have to tell them the truth. The wrath of God, Romans 1.18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. We have to call sin what it is and see it as God sees it. It's not an accident. It's an abomination. It's not a chance. It's a choice. It's not a trifle. It's a tragedy. I think Felix began maybe for the first time in his life to understand what his position was before God. God's righteousness. And Felix knew he didn't possess that. But the second thing he, he, he reasoned with them with, the Bible says he reasoned them of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Now temperance Temperance, a lot of times in, in new Bibles, temperance, it'll be self-control. Temperance, temperance isn't self-control. Temperance is spirit control. Remember, temperance is under the fruit of the Spirit. How can self be under the fruit of the Spirit? <laughs> it can't. In fact, most of the guys, we, we, it's so easy to deal with this with the fellows in the prisons. Say, fellas, you've been, you've been under self-control this whole time. How's that work for you? But I could say that to a Sunday morning crowd too at church. We just, we've, the Sunday morning crowd at church has just learned to hide it better than the guys who are in prison. We've learned to disguise it better. And he's saying, you, you do not have any control over your life. It mentions Drusilla here, his wife, and and he didn't get her lawfully. And by the way, it was his third wife. He was a politician who took bribes. You find out later, he, he, he kept Paul there waiting for somebody to offer him money to let him loose. Corrupt politicians aren't new. Politicians are in it for the money, aren't new. It goes way, way back. So, temperance... Being under spirit control instead of, instead of his soul controlling his body. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. 
what I think, what I want, what I feel. When we say we're in the flesh or after the flesh, it means my soul is controlling my body. I'm doing what I think, what I feel, what I want. The world puts it this way. If it feels good, do it. Do it. And that's how he lived. He lived that kind of a life. And so this spirit control, this temperance, was not something he was familiar with at all. Paul might have told him, Felix, you're an adulterer. You're a murderer. You're an immoral person. And the Bible says these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He may have looked at Drusilla and pointed out how she sold out what it meant to be a young lady. Gave up her modesty and her decency and her purity. He, I don't believe Paul minced any words when he gave him the truth about righteousness and temperance. There's so many things that man, that, that the Bible says clearly is sin. And man has come up with a name for it. So we don't deal with it as sin. And sadly, the church has bought into a lot of that. It is not drunkenness. It's not alcoholism. It's not a disease. It's a sin. The root of the matter is sin. Not my words. God's Word. It's not an alternative lifestyle or an orientation. It's an abomination to God. It's sodomy. God still calls sin, sin. You label it any other way you want. But the contents remain the same. It's not just a mistake. It's not just a weakness. It's not just a chemical dependency. It's a sin. Well, I just have active hormones. No, it's a sin. It's a sin. I'm sure he would have told Felix, Felix, you can't control your passions. You can't control your emotions. You cannot control your lust. You cannot control your desires. But God can. God can. I think Felix would have had a, quite a lump in his throat by now. In fact, the Bible says he was trembling. Can you imagine what he's thinking? I'm here to judge this guy and he's judging me. I'm here to make this guy uncomfortable and he's making me feel uncomfortable. This guy should be trembling in my presence and I'm trembling in his presence. Totally opposite. I think Paul said, Felix, you need righteousness and you don't have it, but it's available to you as a gift. Your conduct's out of control. You're a sinner by birth. You're a sinner by nature. You're, you practice it by choice, but God can bring you into line. Righteousness, temperance, and then a judgment. A judgment that he couldn't prevent. You have righteousness that you don't have, you have temperance that you don't practice and you're going to give an account to God one day. There's a judgment day coming and you won't stop it. Felix, I think it's a great thing that Paul got to give him the gospel. Oftentimes, people that are in a position like Felix who on a, on, in a position of power it gets insulated from the real world. I didn't see the program, but several weeks ago, uh, some show had Bill Gates on it. And they, 
they brought in just normal supermarket stuff. Gallon of milk, bag of sugar, just stuff you, a loaf of bread, things we buy at the store every week. And they were asking Bill Gates what the price of these things were. He had no idea. No clue. He doesn't live where we live. He doesn't live like we live. He's insulated from a lot of the things that we would deal with on a daily basis. He doesn't deal with Walmart. That would be Felix. Money, power, position. He could feel like he was untouchable and then here's this guy in chains telling me that I'm going to be judged one day by God. Felix is trembling. I believe that's conviction. I believe that's the Spirit of God dealing with his soul. But it wouldn't come to Christ. There's a fable which says that there were three devils who were coming to earth to finish their apprenticeship and they were talking to Satan about their plans to tempt and ruin men. And the first said, I'm going to tell them there's no God. And Satan said, well, that may delude a few, but there are many who know that there is a God. The second said, I'll tell men there's no hell. And Satan said, well, you, you probably won't deceive very many that way because men know even now that there's a hell for sin. And the third devil said, I'm going to tell men that there's just no hurry. I'll tell them that the Bible's true and that God is true and that Christ had died for them and that they need to be saved, but they do not have to do it now. No hurry. And Satan looked at him and said, you will ruin them by the millions. The most dangerous of all delusions is there's plenty of time. The most, someone said the most dangerous day in a man's life is when he learns there's such a word as tomorrow. Tomorrow. There are things that no one, that, there are things that must not be put off because we don't know if tomorrow is going to come. History tells us Felix died a miserable man. In fact, just a few years after this event that's recorded for us here, he died by committing suicide. You see, and I'll say more about this this evening, but when you say tomorrow, you lose today. Every day you put off what God wants you to do till tomorrow, you lose another day to live for Jesus Christ. A day you never get back. A day you can never recapture. A day that can never be made up. Sometimes I listen to people who Say they've had a heart attack or they were in some accident and maybe they had an out-of-body experience. So in other words, they'll say, man, I was, I was at death. I've, I've been dead twice. Some, somebody will tell me that. I was, I've been close to death many times. Well, i got news for you. You're closer to death right now than you were then. You are a day closer to death. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this to judgment. Stacy Meadows did not know that Wednesday, March 7th, would be his last day on earth. We were talking to one of the men who sat in front of Brother Dave. Brother Dave knew him. Dave asked what happened, and this fellow told him that he was at work. It was at a, I think it was break time, and 
Said they all came back from break time and Stacy didn't come back. They went looking for him and he was slumped over this, I think in his vehicle or whatever, just slumped over the wheel and he was gone. Just like that. 56, 56 years of age. Unless Jesus Christ returns, none of us are getting out alive. Despite all the advances in medical technology and medical discoveries and the excellent medical care we have in our country, the death rate still is 100%. One per person. Are you one of those ones who always say tomorrow? Tomorrow I'll get saved. Tomorrow I'll trust Christ. Before I die, I'm going to live for God. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to quit that. Tomorrow I'm going to stop that. Tomorrow I'm going to start doing this. And it's always tomorrow. And one day you're going to run out of tomorrows. And your life was wasted. You know what you find out? Tomorrow really doesn't change anything. Changes, changes don't happen tomorrow. Changes only happen today. When tomorrow came for Pharaoh, did he change? Harden his heart. Harden his heart. Tomorrow is just an excuse to avoid the responsibilities of today. Tomorrow's the straw man. Tomorrow is the red herring. God never promised to meet anybody tomorrow. He promises to meet you today. Now. But you have to say now to God. When are you going to accept Christ? When are you going to be saved? You know what your answer should be? Now. When will you surrender to me? When do you need to get baptized? When do you need to become active serving in the church? Now. When are you going to give up the, that stubborn habit or the addiction? Now. When are you going to be faithful to church and faithful to your and get serious about your walk with God? Reading your Bible faithfully, spending time with God, developing a relationship with Him. Now, tomorrow won't change anything. Now, when are you going to give forgiveness to somebody who needs it? When are you going to cleanse the bitterness from your soul? The answer better be now. Eventually, it destroyed Felix. It destroyed Pharaoh. It'll destroy you. Now is the time. When Moses went to Pharaoh, before he ever went to Pharaoh, and he told God, who should I tell him sent me? Remember who God said, should tell, who did God say Moses should tell Pharaoh sent him? I am. I am. Not I will be. And not I was. I am. Why? That's the present. Right now. What is it that God's been telling you to do and you've been putting them off? It will destroy you. Take that word tomorrow and make it today. Let's pray. Father, take the truth this morning. Lord, I'm praying that you will minister to hearts today. I trust you have. That Lord, you help each of us to to deal with what You're telling us to do in our heart today. I do not know what it is, it, what frog our frogs were allowing to stay in our life. It hinders us. They cause us to, to our testimony to smell to others. 
It's not honoring to you. It's, it's uncomfortable. And yet when you deal with us to get rid of those frogs in our life, we put you off and we say tomorrow. Tomorrow. God, I ask you to help people today to say no more tomorrows, God. Today's the day. Now is the time. I don't want another night with the frogs.